this module we will look at kinetic anatomy of horse and rider in relation to equitation. In this module you will identify and describe the key structures of the human and equine muscular skeletal system involved in equitation, explore a range of horse and pony breeds, Determine a condition score for a wide variety of horses and ponies. First, we'll have an overview of terminology. It's derived from Latin and Greek languages. Many clinical terms are more readily translated when broken down into prefixes and suffixes which precede and succeed root words to clarify their meaning. They may appear complex to learn but they're relatively simple to memorize and recall when the foundation words are recognizable. So here we have the prefixes here, suffixes here, Prefixes are at the beginning of a word, suffixes are after. So, for example, the muscle brachiocephalicus is the arm head muscle. Brachy, cephal, head. And arthritis would be joint, inflammation, neuralgia, nerve, pain. So even though it seems like jargon, it is actually quite simple. So let's look at an overview in relation to equitation and the skeleton. And the skeleton in its entirety is of relatively robust construction, consisting of a wide variety of individual bones, some very different. And the composition of which can adapt over time according to the mechanical stresses placed upon it. These stresses have to be progressive since they cannot withstand acute overload. And bones occur in their respective positions within the skeleton according to their protective or mechanical locomotor roles. So you see a very different bone here. So the head is relatively protective. Cervical bones are distinct from the thoracics as distinct from the scapula, which is wide and flat for muscle attachment. Same with the pelvis, that's different. The limb bones, uh, although there are some similarities on the fore and hind limbs. Ribs protective, those are different. And for locomotion, the limbs are a series of complex interacting levers formed by bones either side of a joint. So here and here. To bring about gross movement, although the skeleton is an entirely passive structure requiring input from the neuromuscular system for motion up participating joints. So for example, this is thoracic vertebrae and they really they have a rope through them to keep them together but apart from that they are entirely passive they are nothing without the ligaments tendons and muscles attached to them we have a femur and a pelvis they are, as I said, nothing without the muscles, tendons, ligaments, and nerves to operate those. 
soft tissue structures. The skeleton gives form and support for weight bearing, providing sites for locomotor muscle attachment. It must be coordinated and stable if its component parts are to be protected from injury. In evolutionary terms, the human has not been vertical in stature for as long as the horse has been moving on all four limbs. With four curves in the spine here, here, here in the lumbar, and the final one in the sacrum, the human posture is more vulnerable than that of the equine that only has two curves. So here, and here, cervicothoracic and the atlanto-occipital joints. With four curves in the spine, the human posture is more vulnerable than that of the equine that only has two curves. And those four curves are susceptible to aberrant alignment and rotation. We never evolved to organise and control our upper bodies with our pelvis, we evolved to do that with our feet and limbs. The most obvious biomechanical differences between equine and human skeletons is that one is quadrupedal, four limbs, the other bipedal, two limbs. In equitation, one is tasked to support the weight of the other at varying gates over varying terrain and direction. So a vertical spine of the rider versus a horizontal spine, meaning that the load of the relatively vertical human spine is concentrated in a small area over the relatively horizontal equine spine. There are 33 separate vertebral soft tissue segments sited between the equine skull and the sacrum, including the two articulating surfaces of the last lumbar vertebra. And the articulating surfaces of the equine vertebral bodies have fibrous links. In contrast with the human spine, which has dual tissue gelatinous discs, so they have a soft centre, facilitating greater capacity for multi-plane movement. So the human is much more flexible than the horse. But these discs can readily herniate as a result. In the equine, concealed by the scapulae, the cervicothoracic vertebrae are not readily accessible for therapeutic manipulation. So it means that this region here, it's at the base of a very flexible region of the spine, but we cannot access it for direct therapeutic manipulation or intervention. Some breeds, such as the Arab, exhibit one less thoracic vertebra, so they may have 17 instead of 18. Humans have an upright static limb posture. Horses, a flexed static hind limb posture, and that means they're always ready for flight. A bit like a runner in the starting blocks. The foot or the hoof makes contact with the ground, that is the degree of pronation, like this, in the human foot, and the heel, toe, and lateral geometry in the horse affects skeletal alignment higher up the limb. Notably in the pelvis, as identified by Engel et al. in a 2016 study, and that pronation can predispose to injury, as well as in the rider, affect foot action against the stirrup and hip symmetry. Humans have 12 thoracic vertebrae, 
the sport horse 18. Both have seven cervical vertebrae. Humans have five lumbar vertebrae. Horse has six, but that may be one less in the Arab. Humans have a clavicle bone. This is more to be seen at the front of the body. And that connects the arm to the thorax. Equines have no bony connection between the forelimb and thorax, although their forelimbs have a robust soft tissue connection in the form of a sling system. Humans have a superficial cervicothoracic joint. And in the equine, it's deep. The reciprocal or stay apparatus is a feature of the hind limbs of the horse. We don't have that in humans. And there are soft tissue connections between the hock and the stifle joints to act simultaneously to flex or extend those joints. That means they act together. And it represents a precision energy saving mechanism and also allows the horse to lock those joints, enabling them to rest or sleep whilst remaining standing. The horse rider and saddle load can easily inhibit fluent movement during the respective combined interaction of all three. And in the next presentation, we will take a closer look at various components of the skeleton.